There's an old Japanese legend about love that says that each of us is born possessing a single red thread that attaches from our pointer finger and runs to the arteries of our heart. Then, as we go about lives and former nameless strangers become friends, we form connections and our red strings intertwine with other people's until we die a network of intertwined, connected red strings. Further, as research suggests, we are no more than six degrees separated from anyone, which likewise suggests that we are no more than six red strings、um, separated from anyone else in this crowd. I believe that ideas function largely in the same way. As we go about life and we have different experiences and different interactions, these separate opportunities come together to form powerful ideas. My own story starts back when I was about 12 years old. So during this time, I was obsessed with the TV show called Lie to Me. It was based off of the work of researcher Dr. Paul Ekman, and it was this detective who would determine whether or not people are lying by reading their facial expressions. I was captivated, not only by the storyline and plotline, but more so by the science behind what the face could reveal. Google became my new best friend, and I spent hours reading and researching about the research behind this TV show. Then, fast forward to two years ago, when I was a sophomore in high school, and I was watching a video by the Michael J. Fox Foundation. When I noticed that whenever Michael J. Fox or another Parkinson's patient would laugh or smile with one another, it came off as emotionally distant or unfelt. A red string instantly formed in my mind, and my mind instantly went back to the TV show *Lie to Me*. I wondered if the facial action coding system, which was the basis of the *Lie to Me* TV show, could have healthcare implications. Further, as I started talking to local caretakers and clinicians, they reported similar observations in their loved ones years before diagnosis. I also found that current Parkinson's disease diagnostic methods are severely hindered due to lack of validated biomarkers or objective indicators of disease onset. Further, as I once again returned to Google, I found, as I was reading through prior research, that the same sections of the brain that experience the earliest changes among Parkinson's patients are the same sections of the brain responsible for spontaneous and post-facial expression formation. Meaning, if the, we could find a way to discover and digitize these differences, they could provide early external manifestations of early internal neurological pathology among Parkinson's patients. As I was reading through past research, I was also surprised to find that the number of Parkinson's cases is experiencing rampant growth globally. By the year 2030, the number of Parkinson's cases is expected to more than double, and especially vulnerable are those in developing and remote areas across the world, where lack of early and accurate diagnostic methods will further complicate the disease. Prevent treatment options and pose an increasing societal, economic, and infrastructural threat on current healthcare sectors. I knew that I had to change these statistics and challenge the way that Parkinson's disease diagnosis was currently being approached. So I designed a way to elicit and collect spontaneous and post facial expressions. I sent an email to the Michael J. Fox Foundation, and luckily they responded, and I was able to launch an online study with them. I would have Parkinson's and non-Parkinson's patients watch a series of Super Bowl commercials or replicate a series of emojis while their faces were recorded by their computer webcam. I then broke down the footage I collected using facial recognition software for frame-by-frame -frame calculations for distinct facial muscle movements. I then took the data and was able to mine through the data to discover and validate previously unknown early indicators of Parkinson's disease. These included specific facial muscle movements that experienced differences in responses among Parkinson's patients, such as that involved for the upper eyebrow contraction, and then also interactions between facial muscle movements, such as those involved for the formation of a smile. And these are actually only a few of the larger subset of biomarkers that I was able to determine. Then, using these biomarkers, I then wanted to build a series of、uh, diagnostic algorithms that could accurately determine whether or not a patient had Parkinson's disease. So I taught myself how to code, and after several long nights and failed attempts, it finally worked. 
And this was such an exciting moment in my research, as it demonstrated that I had not only been able to discover and digitize previously unknown early indicators of Parkinson's disease, but I was also able to use these differences to determine whether or not somebody had Parkinson's based solely on their responses to Super Bowl commercials and replication of emojis. I have been able to create a robust means of diagnosis for Parkinson's disease. And as this process is data-driven, I will be able to continue to refine the algorithms and improve in accuracy as I continue to collect responses. One of the most fascinating elements of this diagnostic tool is that it utilizes biomarkers that may occur up to 10 years before the onset of traditional motor symptoms and subsequent diagnosis. This is especially critical because it opens up an exciting opportunity to start developing and testing novel therapeutics, which will ultimately change the way that Parkinson's disease is treated. The technology I use is also specifically designed to be non-invasive and remote, making it perfect for the developing and remote areas across the world, most at risk to the rampant growth in the number of Parkinson's cases. I, so I just started my senior year of high school and I'm currently continuing this research. So this fall I will be launching a series of longitudinal studies which will enable us to really pinpoint at what specific point before current diagnosis are we able to capture these responses. And this process can easily be replicated for other neurological or other developmental diseases um, such as PTSD or postnatal depression, um, which I will also be working on this school year. And I think that the applications of this technology are what most excite me. So first and foremost, this provides a robust means of diagnosis for clinicians around the world. Um, and pharmaceutical companies have also expressed interest in using this technology as a means to progressively monitor Parkinson's disease and again, test and develop novel therapeutics. But from a personal standpoint, one of the things I'm most excited about is that the facial recognition software I used is compatible with that used by companies such as Snapchat and Facebook, meaning these social media platforms could one day provide powerful healthcare tools, creating a selfie that could save your life. So I'd like to end by just taking a step back for a moment. I think one of the most amazing aspects about the way and the process that ideas are formed is that after you start developing your idea into a tangible technology, you can kind of take a step back and look at how all these separate red strings of inspiration came together to form powerful, revolutionary ideas. My mind goes back to our solar system. So through the development of objective tools and technologies, such as the telescope, we have been able to better understand the vast complexities of outer space. Similarly, I believe that through the development of better, more accessible and objective tools and technologies, such as those that I'm working to develop within the sphere of Parkinson's disease diagnosis, we will likewise be able to come to better understand our own inner space. And that is an adventure of a lifetime. Thank you.